Confessions of the Apostles' Creed. And if you turn in the back of the Red Hymnal, on page 845, there you will find the Apostles' Creed prepared for our public confession of faith. But let us now confess this, our Christian faith, as we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now continue to worship our God as we turn to number 36 in the Trinity Hymnal. This is a beautiful versification of Psalm 139. The first line is, Lord, thou hast searched me and dost know. One, it's number 36. privilege as God's people to go before the Lord in a time of congregational prayer, and also now a time for you to make known any prayer requests which you might have. Are there any requests this evening? Yes? So the lawnmowers are also praising God. Oh, it, oh, it still is. Or is that a pressure washer? <laughs> Whatever it is, it's making a joyful noise, so make sure you speak up so I can hear you. Any other requests? Not to discourage anyone. Yes? So 
So I think I heard that your sister-in-law has something with her heart. No, she has cancer Parkinson's. Parkinson's. Yeah. And that's what her mother died of. Okay. I'm glad I asked. Thank you. Other requests. Yes, Ivan. Yes. Uh, my sister-in-law for cancer. Any others? Yes. Anything else? Yes, Anna. Any others? All right, I don't see any more hands. So let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your beautiful creation that testifies all around us that you are the creator and that the hand that made all things is divine. How utterly foolish to think that all that we see in this vast earth, indeed, all that we see in this vast universe just appeared by chance. For Lord, it holds together by your all-powerful word, the word of your son. And we thank you that that same son who spoke that word in the beginning to create who speaks continually to uphold and preserve it in his providence also works now through your word in your church to bring about the life of eternity and redemption in the gospel. And we pray, Lord, your rich blessing upon us as we gather for this so important and holy of a purpose. And may indeed, even as we are called tonight, pay careful attention to your word as it comes to us. We'd remember, too, especially your church, not just here in this small group that gathers. For, Lord, we know we are not alone, but we are accompanied by a great host of saints. Indeed, when gathered from all ages of history in all times and places, they will be a great multitude that cannot be counted, singing with loud peals of thunder praises to you. So, Lord, we pray today for your church universal, especially the persecuted church, we ask, dear God, that you would draw near to them to comfort, encourage, and strengthen them, that you would work in your providence to thwart those who oppress them, and grant, Lord, that they might persevere in their most holy faith. And may they have the great reminder that even as nations and empires have risen and fallen, often announcing the end of the old ways of the Christian faith, those rulers and kingdoms are long gone, but your faith and your gospel still goes forth to the nations. We remember today as well the Kalsvik family and the Sketchleys as they mourn the loss of Greg. We pray that the comfort of your spirit would be with them, that you would uh, draw them near to Christ and the comfort and hope that is in him. We pray for Cheryl's sister-in-law as well as she is having a test for Parkinson's. We pray indeed, Lord, that it would be an accurate and good test and you would give wisdom to the doctors and to her and may your healing and comfort of your hand be with her. We pray for my brother Billy. Grant that you may uh, create a hedge around his life to keep him walking in the good path and free from temptation. We pray for the Zacher sister with her cancer treatments. Bless them uh, that they might be successful for her healing. We pray too for uh, Nathan Yoder's relatives who just gave birth to a baby boy. Lord, we rejoice with them and your good graces to them and bless this little one as he grows. And bless us, Lord, all together in all needs that we may have today. For, Lord, we know that wherever we come from, whatever our troubles, whatever our problems, the problem ultimately comes from our sin. And the solution is the same. It is Christ. It is faith in him. So, Lord, may we not easily drift away from him. But may, Lord, we draw near to him in faith and find in him the salvation and encouragement of our souls. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare now to hear the reading and the preaching of the Word of God, let's take the Red Trinity hymnal again. We'll turn to hymn number 331. 
and ask for the help of the Holy Spirit to guide us and teach us. It's called Come, O Come, Thou Quickening Spirit. Let's stand as we sing 331. You may be seated. Our scripture reading this evening comes from the book of Hebrews. Looking this evening at the first part of Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. you now to give careful attention to this reading of God's inspired word from Hebrews chapter 2. We'll begin at verse 1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Thus far, God's word this evening. Let us now pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for the word of the Son who has spoken. We thank you that it has come with the fullest measure and highest level of authority and finality. We thank you that it reveals to us a great salvation that has come in Christ, incomparable to anything that this world may offer us. And so, Lord, may we especially heed the message of the text this morning, that having received such a great word and a great salvation, that we must indeed incline our hearts to it and pay much closer attention. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the book of Hebrews began with a tremendous contrast and opening declaration. It said in contrast the word of the prophets and even the word of the angels in the Old Testament with the word of the Son now in these last days. 
It's set before us, yes, the, the authority and importance of angel messengers and prophets. Indeed, God spoke through them. But it sets that in contrast to the higher and greater authority and power of the Son. The prophets were servants of God. Jesus is a son. The prophets were servants in the house. As the book later says, Jesus is Lord over the house as the son. It develops in rich, deep theological detail. The unique identity of Jesus Christ as the radiance of the glory of God. The one through whom God created the world who upholds the universe by the word of his power. It set before us Christ in his glorious exaltation after he had made purification for sins and his death and humiliation, now seated at that right hand of the majesty, the glorious Father in heaven. Indeed, it speaks of us as those who are, those who are to inherit salvation as co-heirs in this Son, this Creator, this Redeemer. And now in chapter 2, it brings that message home. If chapter 1 lays out the theological basis for our understanding of the word of God and the revelation now come, chapter 2 drives that home in terms of what's relevant for us as a Christian people. In other words, having received, yes, the word of the prophets in the Old Testament, the law given through angels, but now the word of the Son, that highest, greatest, last word, what ought we to do? The exhortation, the point, is given in chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, connecting this exhortation to what came before, because all thing, those things are true, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. That's the quote-unquote practical application the author gives us. It's a reminder to us of the fundamental importance of of God's word of revelation for us not only to draw us to him in terms of our first salvation but to preserve us in him once we are saved we turn not to the ritual forms of the old we turn not to that which is external and that which is seen instead we turn to what is heard we turn to the word of God and when we hear it we make sure that we pay careful attention to it. Now, as he drives this point home and gives us that reminder to pay attention, to lift up your eyes, to listen carefully, as he does so and as he drives it home, he ties everything together and gives us reasons why that's so important. Now, these reasons are a little more practical, a little more observable than the other ones, but they are reasons nonetheless. See, this is a reminder that every passage of Scripture is really an argument. It's making a case for something. And if you're interpreting the Bible, if you're trying to study it, if you're trying to preach it, one of the first things you have to do is figure out what is the argument, what is the point, and then what are the supporting reasons behind the point. Well, the point is clear. We need to pay careful attention to God's Word. But what are the reasons? Well, I think there's three. Three reasons practically enforced here as to why it's important for us to listen carefully more carefully than perhaps we have to this final word of the son these are the three things first of all the one reason he gives is that this word of the son is part of a final pattern of revelation we need to listen carefully because the word is part of a pattern of revelation secondly we need to listen carefully because it's been confirmed and ratified by many miracles and many witnesses and thirdly and finally, we need to pay careful attention because of the constant danger in our hearts of drifting away from God. So again, the point is very simple. We must pay closer attention to God's word. And the first reason we need to do that is because, according to this author, it's part of a pattern of revelation that has now come to its fullness. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, let me, let me illustrate it first so hopefully you can understand the point. When we hear a command an instruction, or are given a law that we need to follow, there are varying degrees of responsibility that we might have to follow it and to keep it. For example, we who are parents are more responsible 
to follow instructions and laws than our two-year-old is. Why is that? Well, if you have a two-year-old, you probably know that they're not exactly at the point in their development where following rules comes real naturally to them. They lack the capacity and maturity mentally and physically. Sorry, two-year-olds, I don't mean to offend you, but you have some growing up to do. And so we don't hold them as accountable as, a, say, a grown adult who's gone to school and knows better. Well, a similar thing can be said about patterns. If what we are dealing with is part of a pattern and has some repetition behind it, we are more responsible to mark that pattern and do what we need to do, either to follow it if it's a good pattern or avoid it if it's a bad pattern. Let me give you an example. Okay. Let's say, for example, that we've observed time and time and time again that if we try to fix a bike tire on a wheel and we pump it up, that it just keeps popping. Have you ever had that happen where you have a flat tire on a bike and you go to pump it up and you pump it up and you pump it up and then the bike tire pops again? And you think, whoa, what happened there? And then, so you go get another tube from the store and you put the bike on it and then you start pumping it up and you pump it up and boom, it pops again. After you do this a few times, what should you probably conclude? That the wheel is no good. Yes, I'm being a little autobiographical here. I once bought four different, I think it was, well, I think it was four, you can ask my wife later, four different tubes until I finally gave up and realized, okay, a pattern is developing here. I should quit wasting my money on tubes and just go ahead and buy a new wheel. And so it is with anything else. If we're trying something and it's not working, eventually we get to the point where we have to say, okay, a pattern is developing here. It, it didn't work once, <laughs> and so that's excusable, but now that it hasn't worked two times, three times, four times, now I really know I shouldn't do that. And so also if we've observed people try things and fail at them, and it happens repeatedly, that raises the level of responsibility that we have to either do the thing properly or avoid doing the thing wrongly. Well, when we look at Revelation, something similar has happened. When Jesus came to give that last and final and greatest word of God, and when he appeared, as the text says, ratifying it with miracles, with witnesses, with other signs and gifts of the Holy Spirit, that wasn't something that came out of nowhere. It was part of of a pattern, a clearly established pattern of revelation that God had begun all the way back in the Old Testament. When Jesus came and performed miracles and taught the word, it wasn't coming out of nowhere. Jesus appealed in his teaching to what? To the Old Testament scriptures. And he rooted everything he taught in the Old Testament Bible. Likewise, when he did miracles, was he the first person ever to do miracles? No, there were other messengers of God that came before him that had also done such miracles. You see, this revelation of the Son is part of a pattern, a practical pattern that God's people should see and know and be ready for. Well, what is the pattern? Well, if we look at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, we see that it's structured around a kind of comparison and contrast between that word of revelation in all times and the word of revelation today. Again, it's the same basic contrast he made before, now practically enforced. And look at the levels of comparison. This is where the pattern will jump out at you. What's the first part of the pattern? The first part of the pattern is the appointed messengers. God is speaking, but he does so through messengers. And who are the messengers from the Old Testament highlighted here? Well, it's the angels. Notice what he says. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable. So that's the first part of the pattern. He identifies the means or the agents of the message. Well, the angels were of old times, but how about now? Who does he identify? Well, he says in verse 3, it was declared at first by whom? By the Lord. And it was attested to us by those who heard. Jesus and his apostles. So we have first the identification of appointed servants of God to proclaim the message. In the Old Testament, the angels through whom God gave the law. That's the word that's in view here. And now in the New, 
It's the Lord Jesus himself and his public teaching and the apostles. But then secondly, there's also the establishment of that message through signs and witnesses. Now, it's hard to see in the English, but in the Greek, there's a word that appears with reference to the message of the angels and the message of Jesus. And in the Greek, the, the word is bebaios. And that word has to do with something being established or made firm or given a firm basis. We read it in verse 2 where it says, since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable. The reliability, that really gets at the idea that it's firmly grounded and established and has a basis in something that God does. In other words, God doesn't just speak and leave it at that. He also gives signs to ratify and to confirm that what he's saying is true and that it's from God. Now, why do you think God would do that for us? Well, we're weak and we're doubtful. And although we should hear God's word and know that it's God's word and listen to God's voice, we often need helps. And God gave us those signs and means to establish it as helps. And he did that in the Old Testament. In the next point, we'll get into what that was. Here, we're just looking at the pattern. Well, that same word appears again in chapter 2, verse 3, where it tells us that it was declared at first by the Lord and was attested to us by those who heard while God bore witness. There we have in that idea of the Lord attesting to that word, that's that word bebaios, it's making it firm again. So there's the pattern, do you see it? There's first the messenger coming, there's the next the ratifying or making certain the truth of that word in sign and miracle. Well, what's the last thing? The last thing is the warning against those who would refuse to listen and believe and have salvation. We have that warning declared explicitly in verse 2, where we're told that every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. Wasn't that true in the time of the law with Moses? The law of God came, and what happened to those who rebelled in the wilderness against Moses? He's going to talk about that in the next chapters. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, what happened? Did they fall into a nice, cool swimming pool? No, kids, what happened? The ground opened up, and they fell in and were consumed with fire. You see, they received a just retribution. There is a warning and a sign against the danger of unbelief. Likewise, the book of Hebrews is saying that same warning is held out to us. It's more implicit. It's in verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Escape what, you might think? Escape the judgment to come. Indeed, he'll tell us later in the book of Hebrews, speaking of this uh, judgment to come, that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God and that vengeance is mine and I will repay. So you see, there's this pattern of revelation, first established in the Old Testament, appointed messenger, miracle sign ratification, together with a demonstration and warning against falling away, and now in the New Testament, a declaration by the Lord and the apostles, testifying to it through miracles, signs, and wonders, as well as this warning against falling away. And that's really what the author to the Hebrews wants to practically reinforce here, to remind to us that having heard this highest and greatest word of the Son, the responsibility to hear it and believe it and embrace it is greater than it has ever been in the entire scope of history. You see, we must pay careful attention to this word. It doesn't come out of nowhere. It's not as if God's people should be ignorant of it. When they see Jesus come, what does he say? You should be able to observe the signs of the times. You should be able to recognize in me, Jesus says, the patterns of revelation that have come before. Indeed, because that pattern's there, the responsibility is greater to pay more careful attention to what we have heard. But that begs us to dig in a little deeper to this pattern, and in particular to the miracles and witnesses that God put in place to ratify that word. After all, that really is at the heart of this parallel. The fact that the word was established. Remember that Greek word, bebaios. 
Well, that has to do with the miracle signs and testimonies that God made in the ancient times to ratify revelation as true. So in order to discuss this, we need to talk about what is the proper way to understand the miracles and the gifts of the Holy Spirit in the Old and New Testaments. I don't know if you today have ever seen Christians today who do things like speak in tongues. They'll stand up and speak what they claim to be a tongue from a spiritual, spiritual gift from God. They do other things like perform healings and do other things. And sometimes Christians say, what's going on here? Is that something that we should expect today? Well, let me be very clear. We absolutely believe that Jesus and the apostles did those things. We believe in the power of God's supernatural work and his Holy Spirit. Miracles were performed by Jesus. And if you don't believe Jesus performed a miracle, you got a serious problem with your Christian faith. Because fundamentally, our salvation is in a miraculous work of resurrection that will take place at the end of the world. We believe in those things. That's not the issue. The issue is, do they continue today, and should we expect to hear them now? Well, in order to understand that question, or at least understand the proper framework, we need to look at why did God do those in the first place? And what we find in the history of redemption is that God always connects miraculous signs and wonders and those special gifts of the Holy Spirit to new revelation coming from his word. Those two things are always connected. Now, let me at first make a very important distinction. There's a distinction we have to make, and I know it sounds really kind of theological and just like it's chopping logic, but it's an important one to make. And it's a distinction we make between miracles and what we call ordinary providence. Or excuse me, not ordinary providence, extraordinary providence. Miracles and extraordinary providence. Now why do we make the distinction? Because sometimes people say, well, if you don't believe miracles happens today, can we pray for people to be healed? I would say, yes, you pray that God would work a healing in a person. But when you're doing that, you're not praying for a miracle. You're praying for God to work an extraordinary providence. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me give you an example. A miracle is something like this. God raises the dead, instantly gives sight to the blind. Those are things that do not occur simply by merely accelerating the normal healing processes in the body. Okay? Death to life is not something that comes about naturally, you see? Sight to the blind. You don't regain sight through the natural healing of the body to the eyes. Only a supernatural work could do that. On the other hand, there's an extraordinary providence. Let me give you an example of that. Let's say somebody has some kind of trouble with uh, high blood pressure. And we pray for God to help them with that. And they're in danger of a stroke or some other problem. And they go to the hospital and they get a checkup the next week and it seems like the problem's gone and the doctor's like, wow, what happened? <laughs> How is it that, that this happened so quickly? We would call that an extraordinary providence. God accelerated the natural processes in the body to heal things. Now, why is that an important distinction to make? Well, it's important because we don't want to say God doesn't work today because he clearly does. But when we talk about miracles, we have to understand that that has a special meaning in the Bible that always connects it to revelation. And it's such that if we say we are seeing a miracle, then we must also expect new revelation that has authority from God. Let's get into some specific examples, and hopefully it'll be clear to you. Again, the writer of the Hebrews says that the message declared by angels proved to be reliable. It was bebios. It was firmly established and ratified. How so? Well, in part through miracles. What miracles do you remember in the Old Testament that ratified messengers from God? Anybody? Can anybody think of anybody? You get extra credit tonight if you can think of somebody. We might even let you have church inside sometime if you get it right. <laughs> How about Moses, huh? Moses was, was the first great prophet of God. Now, I say the first in terms of being a great and mighty leader. They're obviously, Abraham was a prophet. These other people had prophetic function. But in terms of being a major figure like that, Moses was the greatest in terms of being the first and foremost of the prophets. And do you remember what God told him after he appeared to him in the burning bush? Told him, you're going to go to Pharaoh and 
tell him, let my people go. And Pharaoh's going to listen to you and say, yep, Moses, you got it just right. You can go on out the road. I'll give you a golden chariot, and you can ride out of here gloriously, right? No, that's not how it happened. And Moses knew that's probably not how it was going to happen. So when God appeared to Moses, he asked him, of course, uh, well, wait a minute. <laughs> Uh, how, how are they going to listen to my voice? <laughs> I mean, you're just telling me to go <laughs> tell the people that God sent me, and now you got to follow me and rebel against the king of Egypt and leave. So what does the Lord do? He says, you got a staff in your hand, Moses. What does he tell him to do with that staff? So throw it on the ground. And what happens to the staff when it falls on the ground? It turns into a snake. Actually, a serpent. When we talk about snakes in the Bible, we have to say serpent to say serpent it turns into a serpent and then moses reached out and caught it by the tail and when he caught it and picked it up what did it do it turned back into a staff but that wasn't it he gave him another one he said hey i want you to take your right hand and stick it inside your cloak and when he pulled it out what color was his hand it was leprous it was white like snow and when he put it back in and pulled it out again what happened it was totally and completely clean so you see, the sign was given to help the people believe that Moses was a messenger from God. Indeed, it says in verse 8 of Exodus 4, If they will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign, they may believe the latter sign. If they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the ground. And what's going to happen to that water? What's it going to turn into? Blood. You see what he did? He gave him not one, not two, but three miracle signs to ratify that he was truly a messenger sent from God. And were those the only signs God gave through Moses to let Pharaoh and the people know that God was talking? <laughs> no, how many plagues did we have? Ten. And it's interesting, they didn't really convince Pharaoh. Even the miracles as glorious as they are and as much as they celebrate God for them, the miracles themselves couldn't work saving faith. It's an interesting thing today because you ask people, why don't you believe? They say, well, I don't have enough evidence of the supernatural. They say, well, if you observed a miracle right now, would you believe? Yeah, I guess if I observed a miracle right now, I would believe. You know what? That's not necessarily true because we know people in the New Testament observed Jesus do miracles, and you know what they said? They, they acknowledged it was a miracle. They said, ah, it's not the Son of God doing miracles, it's Beelzebul. It must be a demon. They saw the miracle, but they still didn't believe. God ratified his messengers in the Old Testament with these miracle signs. The point was not the miracle itself, but to point them to the messenger and to the word. Can you think of any others later in the Bible who did miracles in this kind of way to prove that they were men sent from God with the word of God? Elijah and Elisha. Man, you guys are getting real close to having church inside. This is really good. You keep it up because I want to go back in there myself, okay? I can't do a miracle and change the heart of the governor. I wish I could. But what happens in Exodus, or excuse me, 2 Kings chapter 17? Well, that's where Elijah first appears. It's really interesting when you read the Old Testament because Elijah kind of appears out of nowhere. And then he just leaves in a whirlwind. He just shows up. He's like that guy that shows up late. Hey, everybody, how's it going? And then all of a sudden, boom, he's whisked away in a bolt of lightning. Well, when he first appeared, what happened? Well, first of all, the Lord feeds him by the brook. The ravens bring him bread and meat. And then he goes to the widow of Zarephath. And what happens there? Well, Elijah performs a miracle. He takes that jar of flour and the oil in the jug and he makes sure that those are not going to be empty as long as he's there even though there's only a tiny bit left and she's ready to die they keep having enough to make food and then of course by the end of the passage where he then raises up her son who had died what does it tell us at the end in verse 24 what's her conclusion to all of this after she sees these miracle signs this gentile not even a jew says now i know that you are a man of god and that what the word of the lord in your mouth is truth 
Are you starting to see a pattern here with the miracles? The miracles are connected with the messenger and with the message that's being proclaimed. What is it that gives true life? Is it the miracle working power of Elijah? No. The widow, yes, had her li earthly life preserved. Her son even had her, his earthly life restored. But where do they get eternal life? From the word that is in the prophet's mouth. The miracle is connected to revelation. And likewise, when Jesus comes in the fullness of time, we see this pattern ratified and repeated. We could talk also about the apostles. We can go through the book of Acts. This, I think, establishes the basic point. We can, Jesus' uh, ministry is filled with miracles. But in John chapter 3, I think we have a good summary from Nicodemus because he seems to understand and get it. He sees the pattern. Because in John 3, it tells us there was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus who was a ruler of the Jews. And then he came to Jesus by night and he said this, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus was dead wrong about the nature of the kingdom of heaven, wasn't he? <laughs> he did not understand that you had to be born again, but he understood how to identify a messenger from God. Notice what he says again. No one can do these signs unless God's with him. And what does he conclude about Jesus on the basis of that? That he is a teacher, someone who teaches the word sent from God. Do you see the pattern? Miracles ratify the revelation as true. Same thing can be said of speaking in tongues. We don't have time to get into it today, but if you go to 1 Corinthians 13 and the other passages that deal with tongues what does Paul say there he says that speaking in tongues fundamentally is to serve revelation prophecy is the greatest gift to teach and declare what God's word is speaking in tongues in the New Testament was so that people who couldn't understand the language could in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost they hear with the tongues of fire coming upon them, people can hear the word of God in their own language. See, that's why it's an absurdity for people to stand up in service and say that they're speaking in tongues when they're speaking a language nobody can understand. That wasn't the point. The point was to speak in an intelligible language, not an unintelligible one. So the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the miracle signs are all part of this pattern to confirm for us that God's revelation is true. And we have the eyewitness testimony of the Gospels to see Jesus not just do one, two, or three miracles as Moses did, or even ten plagues, or the two great miracles of Elijah at the beginning, but so many miracles that John tells us there's not enough books in the world to contain all the things that he did. Jesus definitively demonstrated that he was a messenger sent from God. And what did that mean? That meant that the people who heard his word were more responsible than any others. Jesus says that it's going to be better for Sodom and Gomorrah than it is for the people that heard his word and didn't listen. Because the people in Sodom and Gomorrah, they didn't have miracles like they saw. Yet both of them end up in unbelief. Indeed, we who live today, we don't see miracles today. We see God's extraordinary providence. We pray for him to intervene in his regular providence. We certainly believe that God is active in the world. We are thankful for that. We don't see miracles today, but we have the rich testimony of the New Testament ratifying and confirming for us in a grand pattern of revelation that Jesus brought the true word of God. See, the issue is not, is there enough evidence? I don't know how many times I hear from unbelievers and those who aren't Christians that I just need more evidence. You need more evidence? Go outside and look up. Look at the create. Go outside on a starry night. Look at all the stars. And then imagine that that's just a tiny sliver, square of the created universe that's out there. And that it's, it's all arranged in this wonderful fashion. You tell me that just showed up. Or read the Bible. Look at its, the history of redemption and, and all that it reveals in agreement through thousands of ages of history. You tell me that's not enough evidence? See, the problem isn't the evidence. The problem isn't sufficiency.
The problem isn't that there's not enough there. What's the problem? The problem is that we're blind. You can put a thousand pages of evidence in front of somebody who has their eyes closed. How much good is that going to do? You can yell really loudly at a deaf person. Is that going to help much? I know we try, don't we? It doesn't seem to work. The issue is our heart. And that really leads us to the third point. Having received an objective word, a word outside of us that's been ratified by a clear pattern of revelation and confirmed, one reason we need to be very careful to listen and pay careful attention is because we're in constant danger of drifting away. That's really the third point. It really is the basic practical point he's making here. We must pay more careful attention. Why? Lest we drift away. In other words, the author to the Hebrews here is revealing something about our hearts, even as believers, that there's something pulling at us, constantly tugging at us that would move us away from Christ. And the thing God gives us as an anchor for the soul, interesting, that's the phrase that the author to the Hebrews uses later, in the promise and word of God to keep us rooted in him. When we look at this little phrase, drift away, it's a great word. Perhaps you can guess where it comes from just by where we might use the word drift. When do you use the word drift? I'll tell you when the, you use the word drift. When the man of the house says, hey, family, it's time to go out on the sound and go fishing. And they fire up the old boat made in 1987, which, of course, we got for a great deal on Craigslist. And when we're puttering out on the sound, booking at about 30 miles an hour, suddenly what happens to that engine? It dies. Carburetor goes out. We forgot to top off the oil. And what happens to your boat? Especially when the tides are moving, you start to drift. It's a word that comes out of uh, the, the nautical dictionary. The idea is, in terms of drifting, is that you're floating by the way a ship would just float by as the wind just blows it wherever it wants. Or as a river would just kind of naturally float by. You can imagine inner tubing. It's not quite warm enough to inner tube yet. It will be soon, right? I, I don't know if we'll have social distancing while we're inner tubing on the river. Maybe we naturally have it. But you just kind of naturally flow with the motion of the river. Well, what this little phrase reminds us is that the spiritual ground beneath us is not stable and unmoving. That spiritual ground is moving. Our hearts are always moving in a certain direction. And what God does and what God gives us tools to do is to constantly pull the heart back from that direction and keep it going this way. To go back to the boat analogy, I don't know how many of you have ever tried you know, fishing in the sound or driving a boat slowly into the wind. One thing that always happens, and it's a real pain if you're trying to fish, because you're trying to drive straight, and you got your lines behind you, and that wind comes in from the north, and then your, your boat starts to go this way. And you're constantly fighting to keep the boat straight. That's what's happening to us spiritually. But what is the power that's at work to cause us to drift? What's the natural inclination and flow, not just of our hearts, of everything around us? Is it towards Christ, or is it away from Christ? I think the answer is simple. It's away from Christ. In other words, he's addressing this exhortation to the heart of the believer. And he's telling us that that heart that we have is one that is not inclined to Christ and to do what is right. It's naturally inclined away from him. And the thing he gives us as the anchor, the steering wheel to keep the ship straight, to keep it from drifting away, is what? It's the word of God. That's the thing to pull on the heart to keep it inclined in the right direction. Or I'll give you another illustration. Maybe you don't like fishing. I'll try to mix up my illustrations a little bit. You figure out the stuff I like pretty easily for my sermon illustration. So let's do something I I'm, I'm maybe don't like so much. How many of you travel and you go in those airports where they have the walkways that move? They're really kind of cool, especially if you've got to catch a flight and your other one was late. They actually move you about, you can go at a running pace. I'm not talking about the escalator. I'm talking about the flat surface that moves with you. I'd like to install them in a lot of places. It'd make life a lot easier. Okay. Well, what's nice about those is when you get on them, the general direction it's pushing you is the way you need to go. 
It makes life really easy. Well, imagine if the airports were designed with those things in reverse and turned up twice as fast. So that in order to get to where you wanted to go, you had to basically sprint across those moving walkways. That's basically the situation we face today in our hearts as Christians. In our hearts, which are pulling us one way, and also the culture in the world around us. Look, I tell you, you go out into the world today, you, you listen to art and music, is it tugging on you towards Christ? No, it's quite the opposite. But God gives us his word. He gives us this message that we need to heed and pay careful attention to. But again, let's focus on this issue of the heart because it's a theme that comes up throughout the book. Indeed, in the very next chapter, in chapter 3, verse 12, we're warned on the basis of a quotation he gives from Psalm 95, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. That's our heart, evil, filled with unbelief pulling us, causing us to drift in the water away from the safe harbor of Christ. Or if you go to chapter 4, where it speaks again in the Word of God, in chapter 4, verse 12, it speaks of this living and active Word of God. Of Word of God and what does it do? It discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Again, we talked about ritualism this morning and a little bit tonight. Do you see how this letter is the antithesis of ritualism? It's not a matter of external form. It's a matter of the heart, and that's what the Word of God is directing itself to. Or later, when he quotes Jeremiah, when he sums up the new covenant and the work of redemption, in chapter 8, verse 10, quoting Jeremiah, that new covenant will be putting the laws in their minds and writing them on what? on their hearts or finally in chapter 13 to conclude the letter in chapter 13 verse 9 he tells us do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace not by foods which have not benefited those who devoted to them you see the contrast the, the strange teachings which of course lead you away cause you to drift bad teaching is destructive whereas in contrast to that you have the grace of God in the word of God that strengthens what? It strengthens the heart but is that what we're naturally inclined to do? I don't think so I mean think about it when you first wake up in the morning what's your first inclination? for me it's go make coffee okay but when that's done, what's my first inclination? Is it to go to the Lord? Is it to pray? Is it to read the word? No, it's just about everything else. Our hearts are not inclined naturally to serve God. If we live just to say and do whatever we feel, how's that going to come out? Good or bad? Well, Jesus says the root reflects, or excuse me, the fruit reflects the root. What comes out of the mouth reflects what is in the heart. That heart we have either has unbelief or it has faith. If it has faith, it has everything. It has Christ. It has eternal life. It has salvation if it has forgiveness. If it has unbelief, it has nothing but death and destruction and misery. And so therefore, beloved, having heard this word and having received that word and having, and having the privilege of hearing that word week in and week out, let it not fall on deaf ears or on sinful, unbelieving hearts, but may it ha fall upon hearts of faith and bear fruit to God and his glory. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful word that you've given us. And we pray, dear God, that you would indeed bless it to us and to our hearts. Lord, we know we can hear and we can understand with the mind, but it is your spirit alone who can write it deep within the heart. And do that, O oh Lord, that not just when we hear, but as we think and as we feel, we may be made like unto Christ, our glorious Savior. For we ask this in his name. Amen.
In response to the word of God, let us sing a song, a, a psalm of praise, asking the Lord to do the very things we've just heard about. It's number 564. It's taken from Psalm number one. It's called Blessed is the Man. Let's stand as we sing. 564. <laughs> church of Christ as you depart go with the blessing of our triune God may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you may the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace both this night and forevermore amen our doxology this evening is number 731